All right, so um, we've gone through introductory material, chapters one through four. That's a pretty good preview of itself, hopefully. Uh, I want to now move into cellular reproduction <coughs> and really begin to deal with how we go from a sperm and an egg to a single cell. That single cell eventually, a multicellular organism, becomes an adult at some point for, for a long period of time. How do we actually get different types of tissue from that single cell? How do we get the massive types of, of tissue? Numbers of different types of tissues, and they all come from that single first cell. Okay? So I want to start with your very first cell. And the very first cell is established between the union of a sperm cell and an egg cell. And this is how it happens in all animals. Uh, and it just so happens also in humans as well. The variation comes in because of differences in the genetics of individual organisms. So for your first cell, the egg that is fertilized by the sperm each contains how many chromosomes? Anyone know? 23 chromosomes. So your first cell comes from that egg or ovum with 23 chromosomes being fertilized by a single sperm containing 23 chromosomes. Now, most of the time, this is the way that it happens, right? There's obviously some variations that you may have. Uh, splitting that occurs, or multiple eggs that are fertilized with different sperm, and so we can get twins and triplets and a variety of different um, numbers of offspring. Any way that it happens, it's still going to involve an egg with 23 chromosomes and a sperm with 23 chromosomes. And if it doesn't, if it's a sperm that has 22 or 24, there's going to be some issues. And most of those issues are, quite frankly, fatal. And most of the time, it would be a, a non viable pregnancy that occurs. Now, there are some instances where humans can be born with more than just the added up 46 chromosomes. 47 chromosomes in an individual who's got Down syndrome. Uh, and that's called a trisomy because there's a triple copy instead of just two copies. There's uh, two copies in, in one of the sperm or the egg and one copy of the 21st chromosome. So they get three of those chromosomes. And there's a couple other trisomies that cause other conditions above and beyond Down syndrome. So whenever I lecture, um, especially when it's an ethical type lecture, I always define humans as having 46 chromosomes <coughs> plus or minus one. Because just because you have 47 chromosomes doesn't necessarily mean that you're some other organism, right? You're still human. So even at the point of conception, with those 46 plus or minus one chromosome, as long as it's non, or it is viable, it's, it's a not non-viable pregnancy. <coughs> Everything that's required in those 46 plus or minus one chromosomes will generate proteins that are human in nature, cells that are human in nature, genetics that are human in nature, right at the point of conception. 23 and 23, total of 46 chromosomes most of the time. And again, you can have plus or minus one. Okay, so that's your first step. It's a combination of two other cells. It's a combination of the ovum, the egg, and the sperm cell. How about your second cell? What happens with your second cell? Well, there's this little thing known as the cell theory. And the cell theory has three different tenets, or three different postulates. And one of those is all cells come from pre-existing cells. So cell number two here has to come from cell number one, which came from an egg from mom and a sperm from dad. So your second L, second cell, 
come from your first cell. And that means that it has to go through some sort of division. Okay? So you're going to take literally in your mind this one cell and you're going to pull it apart. But here in lies a problem. If I just simply pull that cell apart and I have 46 chromosomes in that first cell, I pull it apart, I equally distribute those chromosomes in the second cell, I now have two cells that only have 23 chromosomes. Right? And that's a problem because all human cells are required to, at some point in their lifespan, have those 46 chromosomes. So we have to go through this process of duplicating all of the DNA that's present in that first cell. This is modeled through something called a cell cycle. And whenever you see this term here, cycle, and I'm sure you've run into it before, we have a nitrogen cycle, we have a carbon cycle. The cycle is a term that we use as biologists to try to understand very complex phenomena in some sort of model that has no beginning or no end. So we just simply call it a cycle. So that's what this is here. This is a model that we use to, to try to describe what happens to a typical cell as it goes through life. So if we're going to take our second cell and it's going to come from our first cell, we're going to have to take it through this model called the cell cycle. And so the whole process, we can say, is going to be regulated by that cell cycle. And again, this is just the way that we model it so that we can at least try to understand the intimate intricacies of this process. I think you can drop that shape. So as you can see here in the cell cycle, there are multiple steps all the way around this cycle, and eventually we meet at the end of the process, it's a cycle, so there's really no beginning or end. But we're going to arbitrarily say this is the end, this is the beginning. The end leads us directly back into the beginning. Yes. Never mind. <laughs> so a typical cell cycle. <laughs> One of the classes I took was how to impress and amaze your students by lowering the shade. It was actually so the cell cycle, this whole process is typically 18 to 24 hours in humans. And really the cell cycle is all about taking one cell and converting it into two cells that are exactly like that first cell. So cell cycle is all about making two cells from one cell or from a single cell. Now we divide this whole cycle up into two different phases. And each of those phases is going to have multiple steps incorporated in it. The first phase, which is where cells spend most of their life, is a phase called interphase. Your interface, we have three different sub substages here, G1, S, and G2. Primarily what's occurring through all three of these is we have cellular growth, and then the big thing that happens there in S is duplication of the DNA. So we're going to take the chromosomes, and we're going to double the number of chromosomes that are present. So interphase, cell growth, DNA duplication. There are three steps of interphase. The first one is G1, and 
For you to remember this, I mean, one, obviously that's first, right? So it's pretty easy to cheat. Let's call it growth. And what's happening here, why we're going to call it growth, is because the cell is actively increasing in size. And as you probably can imagine, as a cell increases in size, I have to also increase the mass of the organelles, and I have to gain nutrients, and I have to dispose of waste. So the cell is basically just going through a normal process of development and growth. In simple terms, you can just think of this in real scientific terms, the cell gets bigger. So as the cell gets bigger, it's going to need to accumulate raw materials. Now one of the raw materials that's going to be required <coughs> are going to be the individual building blocks to synthesize or to make a complete copy <coughs> of the DNA here coming up in the S phase. Anyone remember, and I mentioned it, anyone remember how many nucleotides are present in the human genome? 3.5 billion. So every time we do this process, we have to accumulate 3.5 billion, or in excess of 3.5 billion individuals, A, G, C, C, T, S, to make that copy. This is not just going over to the photocopier and laying down the cell and letting it, letting it copy off. We got a massive amount of material that needs to, to be brought in. By the way, where do we get those nucleotides from? Get it from the food that you consume. So after we've had substantial growth, we've accumulated enough raw materials, we're going to get the, a signal and the cell cycles can be regulated to go ahead and to move forward to the next step, which is the S phase. Now, just like G stood for growth, S, I'm going to give you, stands for synthesis. And I'll try to spell it right. And it's synthesis of the DNA. Now that means that we also have to synthesize new chromosomes, which are more than just DNA. Chromosomes also contain a significant amount of protein, protein called histones. So we have to have raw materials, amino acids, to build those histones as well. So we're going to build up a new or new threads, 46 new threads of DNA that are going to be incorporated in each of those 46 individual chromosomes. This process takes quite a long time. You can think about this in terms of sitting down and trying to write 3.5 billion individual letters on a sheet of paper. It's going to take you a massive amount of time. The cell accomplishes this amount of data generation in seven to eight hours. Now, there's a couple tricks that it's going to utilize to do this. One, it can do it really, really fast. An individual molecule that assists in this process of synthesizing DNA can write about a thousand nucleotides in a second. But even at a thousand nucleotides in a second, that's still a massive amount of time. So what else happens is multiple molecules that are involved in the process they go through the process of building that individual molecule of, of DNA at various locations along that linear strand. So really, it would be more like all of you sitting down and the rest of the TMC, probably even Cleveland, uh, maybe even White County sitting down, each of you has a small section of material that you're going to have to transcribe. Maybe you can write a thousand letters in a second. Okay? So by adding together kind of the cooperative um, uh, benefit of multiple enzymes involved in the process and writing really fast, a thousand, work, uh, a thousand letters a second, we can get that generation time down to about seven to eight hours. The end result here is for the DNA to be doubled. So in terms of human, Humans, the cell coming out of G1 into S 
How many chromosomes do we have in humans? I heard it. 46. So we're going to start out with our 46 chromosomes. Another way to write that is it's going to be 23 pairs, right? 2 times 23 gives you 46. So if I got to double my DNA, the cell that comes out of the F phase and enters here into our second growth phase, G2, how many chromosomes? Yeah, so let's call it 92. So we now have a total of 92 chromosomes. So if we just stop right here, we'd have a problem, right? Because each of those individual cells would now have many more chromosomes than we need. We're going to go into G2 next. Anyone remember what the G stood for in G1? Growth. Sure. It's going to stand for growth here as well. This is a second growth phase, and it's actually a so slow growth. And really what's happening here during G2 is we have a lot of checks that are going on. Do we have the right amount of genetic material? Has it all been synthesized correctly? Do we have enough raw nutrients to go through the rest of this division process to make two cells with a similar chromosomal composition? That's the kind of questions that are going to be answered here during G2. We still have some raw nutrients that are being accumulated. We're preparing for this next step, which is going to be the next phase. This is all interphase, right? So from here all the way to here, is going to be interphase. The next phase, in addition to interphase, is called mitosis. Sometimes it will be referred to as M-phase. Interphase and M-phase are the two big phases. Interphase has G1, S, and G2. Mitosis is going to have four different phases, and it's going to be attached to a fifth phase that's not really mitosis, but it happens near the end of the mitotic division called cytokinesis. So mitosis, we're looking at a 30 to 45 minute time period here. Mitosis literally means division of the nucleus or division of the genetic material. So when you think of mitosis, don't think of the whole cell dividing. Only think of that nucleus breaking apart, separating my 92 chromosomes into two equal packets of 46 chromosomes each. So let's take a look at mitosis. You've already looked at it in lab. Hopefully you're somewhat familiar with it. So mitosis really is just dealing with the nucleus, the nucleus divide. And when we divide up the nucleus, what we really want to do is we want to take the chromosomes containing our DNA, and we want to take that DNA into two equal sets. So each cell gets a total of 46 chromosomes. Now, in all organisms, we number the chromosome, right? Anyone happen to know how we number them in humans? We actually start out with the very biggest chromosome, and we call that chromosome 1. So chromosome number 1 is our biggest chromosome, contains the biggest DNA. And as we go through from chromosome 1 all the way to chromosome 21, they're, sequenced, or they're, they're ordered in sequence by size. Then we get down to chromosomes 21 and 22, 22 is actually just a little bit higher, or a little bit larger in size than 21. Just one of those errors that's made in scientific history. So 21 is your smallest chromosome. 22 is your second smallest chromosome. 23 is going to be either an X or a Y. For females, it would be two X's. For males, X and Y. Those are called the sex chromosomes. 1 through 22 are called the autosomes. And those are just... Um, have nothing to do with the development of sex at all. They contain many of our other genes, although I will put it out there that the X chromosome is not just entirely required for defining sex. Eye color and hair color are both on the sex chromosomes as well. And so we would say there are some autosomal genes that show up on the sex chromosomes. Okay, so we got to divide DNA into two equal sets. Hopefully at the end, 
we'll have a pair of one <coughs> chromosome one, a pair of chromosome two, a pair of chromosome three, and so on and so forth in each of the new cells that are being produced. Hopefully, we won't get chromosome one and three chromosomes one, three chromosome ones over in the other cell, and maybe all four chromosome two. We get those equal pairs, and so we're going to have to set it up biologically and physically, mechanically, for that to happen. Before we go into some of the specifics here, what about the cell stuff? I don't know if that's a real scientific word, word that I'm going to use to describe a organelle or a fluid that we find inside the cell. How the heck does that get broken? That's going to be divided as well. So it's divided into the two new cells. However, it doesn't happen with the same rigidity that mitosis does. Mitosis has got to be equal. The same 46 chromosomes being distributed into both cells. When we break everything else up that's in the cell, mitochondria, golden complex, endoplasmic reticulum, honestly, it's just sort of haphazardly just gets squirted into the two forming cells. So one cell is probably going to have more mitochondria, the other cell is going to have less. And what ends up happening is after that process during G1, that next growth phase, the mitochondria gets built in that cell. And you end up with the same amount of material in each of those cells as they develop. Now the two cells that have been produced, which you can see down here in the bottom, and I'm going to take you through this figure in just a second. Those two new cells, anyone happen to, happen to remember what those are called? Yeah, they're called the daughter cells. So two daughter cells form. Mitosis deals with what? Nuclear division, division of the DNA. This process where we're distributing the cell stuff into the two new daughter cells, you can call it cell division. The best term is cytokinesis. And cytokinesis is going to occur alongside the last step in mitosis, which is called telophase. So we typically kind of group all of this together, that the nucleus divides up, and then we have the nucleus division of energy and the cells. So uh, we're going to talk in just a second about the way the chromosomes look here. Uh, and hopefully I'm going to undo some um, misnomers that you may have. Maybe I won't make you really all very smart. I'm not giving enough to apologize if that's the case. Um, so we'll talk about the, the different forms of chromosome that you can see here. Interface, it's very typical that you can't see any light pass through. If you're looking at uh, my closest slides, you can't see any light passing through the nucleus. It just looks like a big black ball or a purple ball, depending on how it's staying. And then you begin to see more and more light. And as soon as you begin to see more light, what's happening is those chromosomes, which are in this kind of diffuse network, they begin to kind of condense down. Think of this as kind of having a big plate of spaghetti and you kind of squeeze it all together and you kind of get a long linear structure. Okay, so we're going through that condensation process as we enter into prophase. And as we leave prophase, the second step through this prometaphase is to enter into metaphase. So you have condensation occurring and then all the molecules of the chromosomes begin to line up. And once they line up on the center of the cell, we call that the metaphase plate, and you have to start to think three-dimensional here. Some of you are going to be good at this, some of you are not going to get it. We'll try to help. So the chromosomes all line up on the middle of, uh, of the cell, called the metaphase plate. It's always drawn two-dimensional because it's really hard to draw things in three-dimensional. But what you need to picture here is that there are chromosomes also stacked up coming off this way. So it's not just one long linear line of the 46 chromosomes. They're actually paired up and they stack up kind of all in this big grouping in the middle of the in the middle of the ball. Think of about a piece of glass being shoved through a next ball. They have to line up there and they pair up 
so that I get chromosome 1 next to chromosome 1, the two pairs that have been created. And then I, and those would be chromosome 1 and chromosome 1 from dad and the copy of the chromosome 1 from dad. And then I have some other place, chromosome 1 for mom and the copy of chromosome 1 for mom. And they all line up on the center of the molecule, or in the center of the cell on this thing called the metaphase cord. And then this is where it gets really crazy. Most people think that it's kind of like a tug of war, and you've maybe been taught that before. The tug of war began, and the, the, the uh, chromosome began to be pulled apart, right? It's actually not true. What's really happening here is each of these chromosomes, in the very center of the uh, chromosome, there's this, this thing called the centromere. The centromere is attached up to this fibrous cord. That fibrous cord, by the way, comes from cytoskeleton, which we talked about earlier. So we dismantle the cytoskeleton, and we set up these long spindles. At both ends of the, of the, um, uh, of the cell, there are these really weird organelles that line up at a 90 degree angle of each other called centrosomes. The spindle fibers are attached into those centrosomes, and then they attach up on the other side to that centromere holding the chromosomes together. In that centromere, there's this structure. It's a proteinaceous plaque, and it's called the kinetochore. The kinetochore is one of the craziest places on the planet because what happens is there's a motor protein in there that has legs, just like you and I have legs, and it literally looks like that kinetochore, that motor protein, has a backpack that's a chromosome, and it just starts walking down that spindle fiber. And as it walks down, the other one, the other kinetic core, the other chromosome walk in the other way, and you begin to see the daylight. So it carries it down to the pole or to the opposite end. As soon as you start begin to see that, that metaphase plate open up, that's called anaphase. As it walks along, you kind of have to imagine, you know, it's a tightrope that goes to the very pole of the cell, and that motor protein begins to walk along, pulling its chromosome along. And as it steps over that tubule, that, that fiber structure, on the back side, it begins to disintegrate. And as it walks along, it disintegrates, 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 until all the chromosomes are pulled down into one hole or one location in the cell. And I have a group of 46 chromosomes here, if we're talking about humans, and 46 chromosomes on the other side. And they've just been walked down to either end. Okay? Once we get there, in the middle of the cell, close to where the metaphase plate was originally, we begin to have another motor protein that begins to squeeze on the cell membrane. This looks a lot like pulling the drawstring on a sleeping bag stuff sack that you pull on and can kind of The motor proteins begin to pull on that membrane and begin to squeeze that um, that cell membrane material together until it finally pinches off, and once it pinches off, you have your chromosome separated through mitosis, and this sort of unequal distribution, but it doesn't really matter because it's going to be regenerated, this unequal distribution of the organelles in the cytosol into those two new cells. And we're left over with two cells that then begin to um, rebuild the nuclear envelope and the uh, chromosomes that are there in the middle of the nuclear envelope they begin to fall back out and go for a spaghetti rather than that bundle fiber. Okay? And then we enter back into G1. And the whole process starts over again because it's a cycle. So let's talk a little bit more about how DNA is organized in the cell. So for a lot of you, the model that you may have in your mind for DNA is probably erroneous. You probably almost always view DNA as just a big thing that was sort of like an X, kind of like a chromosome, right? So if I were to ask you, hey, can you draw a chromosome for me? Most of you probably would draw something either like this or something like that. True or false? Probably pretty true. And you're partially right. That would be a chromosome. But that's one form of a chromosome called a chromatid. And it's only really in that form for one, you know, one fraction, one twenty-fourth of the total life of that cell. So our DNA is organized in this structure called a chromosome. 
And that chromosome is actually comprised of more than just DNA. The DNA is one of the components, but there's also a lot of proteins that are present. And then there's even going to be RNA that's present as well. The DNA wraps around the proteins, and we can take that massive amount of information, between us 3.5 billion nucleotides, and we can condense it enough where we can fit it into something the size of the nucleus in itself, which, by the way, has far better information storage than even your best hard drives. You know, hard drives are far bigger than this, right? So we got DNA, we got protein, we got RNA that make up the chromosome, and the term chromosome is referring to the house for the DNA, and that house takes on a variety of different structures. So I'm going to say that the chromosome exists in different states within the cell. Most often, which is going to occur during interphase, most often the state of the chromosome is called the chromatin network. So most of the day-to-day -day life of the cell, the chromosome is in this thing called the chromatin network. Here's an electron microscope picture of the chromatin network, and you can see that it looks just like a big plate of spaghetti. So within here, within the nucleus, you have these threads that are all kind of interwoven. It seems like it's just this big mismatch of, uh, of genetic material just kind of plopped inside of the nucleus. And that's called the chromatin network. Now, in reality, when we're in that chromatin network, what we really have are individual chromosomes that exist in there. Each chromosome has its own DNA. And that DNA is a big, long, thin thread. And again, this applies to specifically to humans. So 46 long, thin threads. When we're in the chromatin network, it's so dense that with traditional light microscopy, we can't pass enough light through it to be able to have any sort of resolving polymer. So we can't actually see individual threads. We just kind of see the whole mass in just one big ball that usually we interpret as just simply being the nucleus. So we can't see it under light microscopy. What you are most familiar with, this structure right here. So here's our chromatin network, kind of more of a 3D picture of what that looks like. And by the way, each of the chromosomes, they can be found in there, and they're, they're in a region of the nucleus, I can kind of outline where one of them may be. And we call that region a chromosome, uh, a chromosome region. So you would have one chromosome that's kind of just bleh right here in this area, all kind of spilled out, sort of in this just spaghetti-like uh, consistency. What, you would else, what else you would have in there is you'd have all kinds of enzymes going in and interacting with that DNA, helping to regulate what genes are going to be produced to produce proteins for physiological function. Then as we approach uh, mitosis, so we go through S phase, and we leave it kind of in that chromatin network, go through G2, stays in the chromatin network, and then we come into, into, S, uh, into mitosis. And during prophase, we begin to see light coming through. And what's happening there is we're beginning to compact towards this structure here, which is what most of you are familiar with. This form of the chromosome is called the chromatin. So that molecule begins to condense into this structure that's known as a chromatin. Again, happening primarily during mitosis.
And as it happens, as you can kind of imagine, it would be kind of like taking two big handfuls of spaghetti and clumping them up. And I'm going to be able to begin to differentiate those two handfuls of spaghetti. They don't just look like one big plate of spaghetti anymore. And so under light microscopy, light begins to pass through. And we get sort of this visible, it looks like threads in the nucleus. Condense further, and they finally get into this condensed form, the chromatid. And really what you're looking at here is you're actually looking at the original and the copy. So individually, that guy, no, that doesn't really work out. Just one of them, just one of them there would be a chromatid. I take the original and the copy, and I sweep them together at this structure called the centromere. And that whole thing is still a chromatid, but because there are two of them, we call them sister chromatid. And it's going to be the sister chromatid that's split apart as we go through uh, anaphase and metilophase with mitosis. Okay? Um, if you give me just a second here, I suspect that you probably have only ever seen the world of mitosis in very static terms and pictures. And I got a couple videos that I want to show you. Um, one of them is just going to be a, a normal old animal cell that's going through mitosis. The other is actually going to be a breast cancer cell <coughs> undergoing mitosis. Cancer, there's a problem with the cell cycle. It goes unregulated, and that means that the cells of a, of, of a tumor in an in a, uh, individual with cancer, there's no regulation. And so mitosis just continually happens. And that's why you get that lump or that mass of tissue because the cells are just being over, uh, overly ge re uh, generated as we go through that process. All right. So this first one is just animal cell division. And hopefully we can let's see if I can make it bigger. Okay, so this is using a form of microscopy, what you can see down here at the bottom. It's called differential interference confocal, or contrast, rather, microscopy. It's just basically a technique where we can look at living cells. We don't have to stain them. So this would actually be a living cell, and that's why it makes it easy for us to do this. We attach a camera, high-definition uh, camera, onto our microscope, and we can filter. Most of the time, you're looking at slides that have been stained to allow that contrast to exist. There are techniques that we can use where that contrast makes it easier to differentiate the structure. So in this picture, you are looking at cell membrane all the way around here, and then inside of here kind of looks like lumpy plate of spaghetti. That's going to be your um, chromosomes. And the video here is going to point out a few things as we let it run. So you can begin to see them condense, and they become very obvious. Oh, yeah, that looks very much like a chromosome. We're going to eventually see metaphase plane. Okay? So they're just pointing out individual chromosomes. They line up here right in the middle. We're going to draw in our line. There's our metaphase plate. And now we're going to begin to separate. Our anaphase and the telophase, and now you have these two clumps of chromosomes that are going to be packed together, and then eventually we should see the cells cleave here through cytokines. And we now have our two new daughter cells. Sped up, obviously, normally it takes 30 to 45 minutes for that to complete, but it is this, it, whenever you look at the slides, it's always this very static prophase, then metaphase, but there's a transition and you kind of slip through both of the phases. So whenever you're looking at slides, you're really looking right in the middle time point that you can call metaphase, right in the middle time point that you can call anaphase. The other video here that I have for you is breast cancer in, uh, or uh, cell division in breast cancer. And there's a slightly different technique that's used here. It's still a living technique, so it's a video. Um, but they uh, use a fluorescent tag to highlight the chromosomes. So what you're going to see is those chromosomes are going to light up if it comes up, hopefully it will. So the chromosomes will light up as they go through that process. And you're going to kind of see 
these bright lights that turn on the chromosomes as they go. And you should recognize metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Oh, that's cool. Server execution failed. Awesome. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Let me pause it, and uh, we'll, we'll get you kind of oriented here to everything that's going on, because there's a lot going on here. So this is an individual cell right here, and here's the nucleus, okay? What's lighting up is when the chromosomes are going through that, that process. Um, probably, I don't really know the origins on the video here. My guess is that it's probably done in a cell culture dish, so this was um, some cell model of cancer. It's on a dish, and they give it the right nutrients to keep it alive, and it just kind of does its thing. And we can grow tumors right there in future dishes. So it happens really, really quick, but hopefully you're beginning to see that, that we have cytokinesis can be identified. You can see that metaphase plate that's forming, all of that stuff. And then it basically is going over and over again through interphase, that mitosis, interphase mitosis, over and over and over again. That's obviously sped up as well. Um, cancer, really what's going on with cancer is it's just totally unrestricted and it just keeps on going even though it's not supposed to. And even when we don't need to repair or regenerate, regenerate tissue, you have new, new cells that are being produced. And they begin to accumulate, right? And that's what forms what we would call a tumor. So we've built two cells so far, right? And both of those cells, as you probably can imagine, are pretty identical. Same number of proteins, they probably have the same proteins that are turned on, same type of mitochondria, density of mitochondria, everything is really very, very similar. But as you know, you now have, as an adult, a wide variety of different tissues. You have tissues that make, you know, cells that make up the tissue known as blood, and cells that make up the tissue known as liver, and cells that make up the tissue known as his brain. So there's a bunch of different cell types, but they all come from this original cell that was created just shortly after conception, or right after point of conception. The process of taking those individual cells and turning them into new types of cells so that we can generate the large number of tissues that we have to, to make for an adult human, the process is called differentiation. Some differentiation. So here is a, a, a kind of a schematic of the differentiation process. And we start here from our original cell at fertilization, and then pretty soon we have the developing embryo with multiple types of tissue, primordial tissues that are going to give rise to the tissues that can happen in adulthood. And really they're going to be well developed by the time the individual has gone through its fetal stage and is born. So differentiation. So Start off from our first cell, and after about the fourth cell division, you're going to have a ball of cells. And that's what you can see here on day number four is this ball of cells. So fourth division is roughly about 96 hours. What you can see through the first couple of days here, we start out and we really don't get any bigger. We basically remain just about the same size as that original cell. But we go through these repeated divisions of the cell, duplicating our DNA, dividing. So we're getting more and more cells. By day four, we're in this sort of ball of cells. And there's 16 cells that are present. So 16 different cells. And as you're looking at that, you'll notice that some of those cells are colored in sort of a yellowish color, and some of them are colored in sort of an orange or a red color. And that's done on purpose. And it's so that it illustrates that those 16 cells are organized into two different layers. You have an outer layer and you have an inner layer.
So we form our two layers, and that outer layer is in direct contact by this point, by the way. Day four, this is right around the time that we have implantation in the uterine wall. So we move, uh, fertilization occurs in the uh, fallopian tube or the uterine tube, and that, uh, that cell begins to make its way through the fallopian tube and implants into the uterus. All the way, it's going through those first three days. So this outer cell, this outer layer of cells rather, is in direct contact with the uterine environment. By contrast, the inner uh, cell layer is protected from the uterine environment. So this inner layer here in red is protected from that uterine environment. It's protected from the mom. Okay. Now the consequence of this, the consequence of those two layers, one in contact with the uterine environment and one that's protected from the uterine environment, is we end up with two very different rates of exposure to waste products, nutrients, glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, those those um, exposure rates are going to be different between the two layers. So if we start here with the outer layer, that environment is chemically unique. And when I say chemically unique, I mean in comparison to uh, that inner layer. So those cells are being exposed to the hormones that are now being generated by mom to help maintain the pregnancy. Progesterone and estrogen are two of the big ones. <coughs> We're going to have different concentrations, and again, always comparing back into the inner layer, so different concentrations of nutrients. As you can imagine, this outer layer has direct access to the nutrients. That inner layer, the nutrients need to come through that outer layer. So we have different concentrations of nutrients, in particular, oxygen and glucose, two very important nutrients for growth and development. We're going to have different concentrations or different uh, levels of waste removal. The inner layer is actually going to be exposed to carbon dioxide for a longer period of time. And that's just simply because we don't have the uterine environment to pull that away. So any of the CO2 that's produced by these cells in the middle, it, it remains in contact with those cells, surrounding those cells for a longer period of time. So the inner layer has that increased CO2 or that prolonged, prolonged exposure. One other thing that happens to that inner layer as additional waste build up, we have changes in pH. The inner layer is subjected to a slightly lower, more acidic environment compared to the external cells, the cells in that outer layer. So really what I'm telling you is that the environment on the inside versus the environment on the outside is totally different. Now, if you live someplace completely different from, let's say, Cleveland, Georgia, as you can imagine, there's going to be some changes that happen. If you live way up north, you're probably going to have lighter skin color because of less exposure to the sun. Your environment changes, and that, envir that changing environment causes changes in the physiology. In order for that inner layer to handle the pH and to handle the CO2, I need to turn on a completely different set of proteins compared to that outer layer. So sort of the net results here. Is I begin to have different genes being expressed depending on what location I am in, what cell location I am, I'm in. Now the thing that's cool here, right, that the DNA, regardless of where you are, the DNA is identical. And we've already established that through mitosis. 
So the DNA is identical, but what ends up happening is we get different RNA, and in particular that RNA is producing different proteins relative to the environment that you are exposed to. So what begins to happen at those two different layers, different proteins begin to build up in the two different layers. Remember what I say about proteins? Proteins confer physiology. So if I have two different sets of proteins that are being expressed in my two different layers, I have two completely different physiological responses. I have two completely different physiologies in those two different layers. And it's going to be that physiology that begins to define how that, how that tissue functions or how those cells function as a tissue. So what you see through most of the rest of this figure are additional layers being added, new cells, new proteins being turned on, different unique embryonic tissues developing. And those unique tissues in response to the unique proteins produce some very unique functions. I'll stop there. And what we'll pick up with, I just have just a small little section of notes to go through there on Friday before we move forward to the next section. Uh, and we're going to, this was, this would be called early differentiation. How do we get those early embryonic tissues? And then from those early embryonic tissues, how do we begin to develop tissues that are going to be required after?